Hi, everyone. I'm Moira Forbes, and welcome to The Takeaway. Joining me today is John Barbados, who's one of America's preeminent fashion designers. He founded his namesake men, menswear label known for its rock style in 2000 and very quickly built a brand that's continued to redefine the fashion industry and menswear given his unique vision. And since then, he's also continued to expand his creative impact um, with ventures at the intersection of fashion, style, and culture. Today, we'll hear about some of those ventures. We'll hear about how he built such an iconic brand and his perspectives and lessons learned that all of us can put into use, uh, how he's navigated some of his critical career junctures, and also his latest endeavor, the tequila brand he launched with Nick Jonas, Villa One. Welcome, John. Thanks so much for joining us. Very excited to be here. Thank you for having me, Laura. I, I want to start off because I think both your career, which, you know, which we'll get into a little bit, but but also, um, um, you know, your brand and your creative vision is something that I think is so interesting because it it celebrates in so many different ways the intersection of art and fashion and, and style, which seems to be this through line of your career, not just in fashion, but in terms of uh, the ventures in music um, and record label and obviously the tequila brand that I just mentioned. I, I would be curious how does um, your experience in, in the fashion world help you and inform how you built this, this tequila brand? And how did this speak to um, what you've talked about in terms of, of the fact that you're less interested in fashion than you are in style? Yeah, well, I grew up in Detroit and I wouldn't consider it, especially the time that I was growing up there, any any bit of a fashion kind of town. So it's definitely more of a blue collar town. So um, fashion wasn't really a thing for me until I became, uh, until I really got into college, really understood maybe a little bit before that, when I started to understand that girls liked when I dressed a certain way. So that was important. And it kind of drove me, um, drove me a, a bit into the, uh, the world of fashion, but I, I always was intrigued by the characters who carried themselves in an interesting way. And it could be somebody as, you know, both handsome, but also simple in terms of his style is Steve McQueen. Um, and because he he just carried himself. And I don't think that fashion is really about the moment, but style is something that kind of lives on. And and it's it's also a bit of how you, you know, how you, like I say, how you carry yourself as well. So I've always thought about that um, as I was growing up on how people kind of portray themselves and how they carry themselves. And also importantly, how they're perceived by other people. And it's not necessarily by the clothes. It's again, the style isn't necessarily about the clothes. It's about how you carry yourself. Um, so as I as I look at my um my business and how I've, you know, you know, navigated things throughout the years. And even when it comes to launching Villa One, you know, I've always been a sponge and I've always tried to learn as much as I can about everything that I'm touching. And I, I would say that that's probably the biggest thing that's kind of helped me. And as I get into like taking the fashion, uh, my fashion background with the John Barbados brand and whether it's the endeavor into music or into the tequila world, it's really like, where's the places that I fell down and, you know, scrape my knees? Um, you know, what, you know, what's changing in the world of marketing, for example, since I started my brand in 2000, I mean, we, there wasn't really digital marketing there. Well, you know, we, 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 know each other from way back, but um, there wasn't really anything on the internet of any, there wasn't even really e-commerce that was really, you know, in 2000, that was really in any real shape or form, for sure in fashion. So a lot of it is how we communicate with the consumer, how we get our messages across to the consumer. And it's something that I love. And it, it probably it's it probably gets down to one thing, which is storytelling. I, I think about this a lot because I love telling stories. Um, and I love, you know, I've always thought about the music world, too. And what, what's great about music for me is that it's discovery, you know. So how, it's the discovery and then sharing the discovery with people as well. So those stories of the discovery were always important to me as a young kid because music was kind of my thing. And Detroit definitely was like a um, hotbed for all different kinds of music from rock and roll to Motown, to gospel, to jazz, to blues. We really had it all probably more than any other city. 
Um, so I really got deep into the what those stories that were behind those artists. And when I think about whatever I work on, I think about how do we communicate our message? How do we create interesting stories behind our brand that stay with people, that mean something to people? And, and so as I you know, did at John Varvatos, we're trying to do the same thing with Villa One Tequila, which is we really, it's about connectivity. It's about um, sharing good times with friends and family and that type of thing. And, and those good times and even the story of how we started the brand is really something that connects with people. So I guess to sum that long rant on, it's really about, so much of it is about storytelling and being that sponge to really understand, you know, you know where the path you should head and not necessarily that someone else's path is gonna be yours, but at least you have some guideposts to understand what's been working and not working out there. I want to drill down on, on, on some of these, these guy posts, because I love how you talked about sort of this through line of the work that you've led and what's interested you in terms of storytelling. And that really is, you know, the connective tissue um, around how you build a successful brand. But now more than ever, in some ways, it's it's easy to build a brand that, that may be successful for a short moment. It's, it's very different to be able to develop an iconic brand. And, and you're someone who did that um, within the fashion industry and is continuing to do that uh, across so many different categories. What were the rules or were there certain an ethos um, that you always leaned into that allowed you to really build such strong brands or, or guideposts, as you will, um, you mentioned um, in that arena? Yeah, I mean, I had I had good schooling on that, and it wasn't necessarily the university, although that 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 had a part of it. But for those guideposts, I was lucky enough to spend a, a big part of my career at Ralph Lauren on two different stints, and and have a very large role there as head of men's design. I also was head of men's design at, at Calvin Klein as well, and those two brands were great storytellers. Very different, very different in the way they told their stories. You know, Ralph created the American dream. Um, and I use him probably as the biggest guidepost because it really had nothing to do with my brand in a way. I, I kind of moved so far away from that. But what he did so well was stay true to who he was. He always had that bar. First of all, he always wanted to raise the bar. The bar was never high enough. So that continues to drive me to this day is always to continue to drive, raise the bar. But it's also making sure that you stay true to yourself, that you're not chasing something that isn't necessarily part of your DNA or ethos, that you also have the thought process to expand your DNA, because just standing still in today's world isn't good enough either. Um, but I think that People buy, bought in at Ralph Lauren very much to that kind of fantasy and that dream and that lifestyle. Um, and I, for my, in, in, in my world, I wanted to find a place that people would buy into that as well, um, mostly because they loved it, not because we were marketing it, but just because they had a connected, you know, connective uh, uh, piece to it, you know, something that really was, it, that touched a part of their, of their life or their history. Yeah, you know, when people learn that, that you worked so long at, at Ralph Lauren and, and were such a transformative um, force within the company, um, you know, you mentioned that that your brand um, is a is a departure in many ways. Obviously, though, still connected on this this idea of um, of storytelling and having a clear vision. But I, I want to shift gears to talk about when you decided to strike out on your own, when you decided to, to launch your company. You know, you were at Ralph Lauren, you mentioned head of menswear. That's probably was considered one of the best jobs in the industry at, at the time and in terms of the biggest brands in, in the world. Um, not many people will walk away from that type of job. Um, you've mentioned you had, you know, you had a young family at a time. You could easily have just sort of coasted um, in, in the fashion world. You are also 43 years old, um, which is interesting because so often we when we talk about um, entrepreneurs or striking out on your own, you know, there's a myth of, 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 of sort of that, that being a youthful endeavor. What were the pros and cons um, of this unconventional background at 43 versus, you know, let's say early 20s? And the fact that you didn't even start originally as a designer. Yeah, yeah. The pros, the pros were that I had all this experience under my belt at that point in time. I knew, 
I knew the the mistakes that that I had made, that other people around me had made, that our brand had made at Ralph Lauren or Calvin, that type of thing. I knew the things that made most sense to me as a person and to me as a brand. They're not all the things that they do either because not everything makes sense. Um, So, you know, those were the pros really that I, you know, starting out at 23 out of college or 25, you think you have an idea and some people do, but it's a very small number of people that really have that idea and then are able to carry it for 20 years. Um, because they have that idea sometimes, but they can't continue it. It has a mo- it's a moment in time. It's not something that la- that's lasting. And I think having the background and also being that sponge that I talk about um, and trying to be, you know, a master of more than one thing. Um, and really, you know, because sometimes you try to do it all and you're a master of none, but to try to really be a master of footwear and of leathers and tailoring and sportswear and all those different things um, were, were important. Um, I think the, the, the challenges were that, um, you know, really, I probably, and some people would say my age, I never thought of my age at 43 being anything, but, you know, now's the time. That's kind of how I looked at it. And I had an idea. Um, it was, you know, I guess it was at the end of 1999. And I had a, an idea as I was walking through Barney's, um, rest in peace there. And I was looking across the landscape of menswear at that time. And I thought, wow, you could just change the labels on a lot of these clothes and people wouldn't know which brand is which because there was a lot of similarity. Everything was kind of black and nylon-y and it was, it was, they were kind of following the Prada sport kind of mentality. And I thought, what a time to do something different. And so that was when I, you know, I, I went to that happened on a Sunday um, and I could go on to the whole long story and how it happened. But within a few days, I sat down with with Ralph and told him that I um, what was going to leave. Well, five months later, I was still trying to convince him that that was the thing that I was going to do. But the thing that really was kind of the turning point in my head to really like move move, move at that point in time was that Ralph's office was right next to mine. And I sat, he sat down with him one day and he said, okay, I know what we're going to talk about here, but I, I have one question for you. Do you really feel like you have something really new to say? Because if you don't truly believe that you have that, you can do anything you want here. You, you know, you're part of the family and you can write, as you said, you can kind of ride into the sunset here and have a great living and a great life. And that was my time that I could have said, yeah, it's comfortable here. I love my family here, everything else. But I said, I really do think I have something new to say. And that's, you know, when I really set out from that point on. Something that that I I read that you talked a lot about in in terms of your success is, you know, obviously having this unique vision and and point of view and and focus, which is so critical. But you talk about um, the fact that it's one thing, you know, to have a dream and that's incredibly powerful, but really that success comes down to execution. So if the ability to execute is is the difference, you said, between dreamers and, and, and doers, what have you learned about focus and execution as your career has evolved? And, and what advice do you give to others in, in terms of how they should think about that, whether they're striking out on their own, but, but navigating these critical career junctures? Well, first of all, I'm still learning. I'm still trying to focus. Um, and that never ends. But I definitely know a lot more about that at this point in time. Um, and I do think that Execution is everything because, you know, you have to be able to bring your dream to life. And you also need to make sure that your organization and your team can also execute your vision and your dream as well. And that it, although you may be pushing them, that it isn't become such a burden that it collapses the organization. And I have felt that a few times over my career where we really are just on overload. Um, Sometimes you have to push through because that's how life is. But other times it really makes you kind of sit back because during COVID, you really needed to push through in a different in a different way because the world is shut down. The communication is different. You're not traveling the same way. You're not in factories like you were before. You're trying to do it via Zoom and we're doing something that's tactile and it isn't the same on Zoom either. So um, 
But I, I think it really is about um, clarity in terms of what you want to do. And um, we all, anybody who's a big dreamer loves to do as many things as you can do because you get excited about all these different ideas. I think the the reality is to really be able to sit down with your organization and team and talk through those things and what are the things and get them excited too, but what are the things that we all feel that we can actually deliver? Because in the end, if you can't deliver, it doesn't mean anything. If people can't enjoy your dream or your vision, then you then you failed. So obviously there's this, you know, you you really honed in on this, you know, both the the softer skills, the creative skills in terms of of being able to create this brand identity and obviously also this relentless focus on on execution. How across the course of your career, particularly because you've you've um, worked in so many different arenas, how did you learn to reinvent and stay current? while also, um, you know, remaining true to your brand? Were there certain um, um, questions or, or rules that you tried to follow or check-in points um, within your career so that you managed to, to balance that, that force? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, I do think there is those things that there's things I get excited about every day. And then maybe the next day or two days later, I'll come back to everybody and say, let's take a step back here. Like, are we really, is it really right? I just had a meeting with my team yesterday about that as well. And, you know, we were looking at what we had just brought to the table, which we were very excited about. And then we were looking at what, because we worked so far in advance. And then we were looking what was following it. And we're saying, is that really as connected as we really want it to be? Does it really talk to the same consumer? Um, and does it expand their, does it expand our consumer base in the right way? So, I do think that I sometimes it's at two o'clock in the morning when you wake up or four o'clock or whatever, and then you can't go to sleep thinking, you know, because you're thinking about it. But I do have those those moments where I I, I do check in with myself about it. Um, and sometimes it's just a matter of, you know, things just starting to feel either really right or really wrong. I think in terms of reinvention, I think the thing there is that it's part of it's either in you or it isn't, I guess, you know, I also say that you need a team around you that can also dial into that thought process and also play a part in that reinvention. It's not about one person. So, you know, you can have an idea or somebody else can have an idea. It's how do you, how do you incorporate that into the organization? So, but a reinvention for me is something that I constantly, it's my head is my wheels are turning all the time. So you're thinking about like, no matter where you are, you're thinking about something's popping in your head. You're making a note. You know, of course, now it's on a phone, but you're making a note on something you're thinking about or taking a picture of something. Uh, it could be a rock just because you love the tone, whatever it is. But um, you're you're capturing something in the moment to to bring back to you later. I always have. I also have a board that I always have um, in my studio, which is just ideas that are kind of going through my head that may not mean anything to me at the moment or not mean enough to what we're doing at the moment, or we can't get to it, but are things that we should always walk by that board and think about, is this the time? Do they, do we take them off? Cause they really don't mean anything or do they, do we put them into the, into the queue to start working on? I, I love that because I think it goes back to what you've talked about in terms of being a sponge and, and just remaining open. And, and you can see a spark of something in something, even if you don't necessarily know where it'll lead or how you connect it. Um, you know, a, a, eventually it often does. But as you build and scale businesses, as you launch um, um, different ventures, there's always going to be incredible business pressures, right? I mean, COVID in the last year was a great example of it on, on all businesses, particularly retail. How have you learned to maintain creative focus when you're working amid those types of pressures, but also, you know, the grind of it year after year after year. It's one thing to have a great collection um, or a great product, but to to do that over and over again is very, very different. You got to be excited first. If you're not excited about what you're doing, then it becomes a grind. And there is still grinds within the within within even the excitement that you're doing because it's it's kind of relentless. Um, and I talk about relentless execution too, because again, if you're not relentless about the execution, it's not going to be what you want. 
But um, I, I do think so much of it is, 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 you know, probably in one word, which is really passion. And if you're really passionate about what you do and it really means a lot to you and it means a lot to other people and to your organization uh, and the consumer, hopefully, um, you're, you're kind of, you know, the, like I said, that, that hamster in your head is constantly spinning around on that wheel to the point of some time that it could be distracting in a meeting because you're thinking about something else. Um, or, or you're not just, you know, you're not resting the way you need to do because that wheel's turning as well. But um, I think passion is, passion for me, I think is, is what drives anybody who's creative, anybody who you don't even have to be creative to be passionate because you can just be passionate about, a, you know, something that you're involved with. It could be a philanthropic thing that you do and you're so passionate about it. I think it's that waking up and eating, drinking, breathing, sleeping, what you do and having that be um something that also rubs off on a lot of other people. And I don't, I always say to my teams, you know, do what I say, not what I do. And I don't expect everybody to do it at the level or at the, the, the pace sometimes that I do. Um, but I do expect them if they are passionate to have those wheels turning, at least within those work hours, for sure. You've um, you know had this incredible career span before launching your own company as an entrepreneur. Now um, you know record label. You wrote a book, um, the Tequila Brand. All of these businesses have ups and downs and, and different life cycles. Um, as people are thinking about um, their own career cycles or, or the challenges they're facing in their businesses um, or as entrepreneurs, are there one or two pieces of, uh, of advice um, that you've learned? Um, probably the, the hard way as we all have in terms of navigating those obstacles um, throughout your career? Yeah, sure. Don't be, don't be afraid to ask questions for sure of other people, also within your team, but also outside of it for guidance. You know, I, I, I mentor a number of students and, and entrepreneurs over the years and continue to. And I always say to them, like, you know, any questions that you, I might not be able to answer half of them, but any questions that you have, you should be asking because I think when you think you know it or you you're on the fence of something, you have to take stock of what you know the reality sometimes are with other people's successes or failures. And then you can make the decision whether you know it's the right thing for you or not. Because just like leaving Ralph Lauren, for me it was the right thing to do. Uh, you know, I never look back. I love Ralph, I, he's been a close friend. But I never looked back from that it was, you know, because I, I was very clear on what I wanted to do. And I think that that's for me is, you know, that it, it, the focus thing, the, you know, um, and just, you know, I, I said it, the first thing I said was being a sponge. I really feel like even during this period in the last year and a half with the, the world crazier than ever, I've done more reading, more research on what's going on. In all aspects, not the creative aspect necessarily, but what's happening digitally in our world, what's happening socially in our world. And I'm not just talking what, um, you know, I'm talking socially, meaning, you know, communication, that type of thing. Um, and what's changed in our world of marketing and the manufacturing and the um, sourcing and the shipments and everything's changed because nothing as is as it was. And I guess I always want everybody to think, including myself, and I have to wake myself up about it sometime, just because it was that way last season doesn't mean it's going to be that way. Now, for a long time, at least in the fashion industry, there weren't that many changes. It just seemed to be this very um, slow paced, especially American fashion, doesn't mean there was anything wrong with it, but it, it kind of grew slowly. And then with fast fashion, fashion growing on the West Coast, East Coast, Global fashion with communication being instantaneous with the internet, um, everything changed at that point in time. And everything moves at a significantly different pace. And you got to be ready for that. Um, or you will be you will be left in the dust and your brand won't be what it was before. 
As we begin to to wrap up, I, I want um, to ask a, a question about um, obviously the influence of rock music across your career. You know, you said it's been part of your DNA since you were you were a child, um, and you've described that for you, rock has always been about rebels. That it's not always necessarily a music thing. It's more about the spirit of it. Um, for you, what does it mean to be a rebel within the business world? You know, I'm thinking outside of the box, uh, being a leader, not a follower. I mean, our industry is full of follow. Most industries are full of followers and some of the followers are super successful and they do it extremely well. But for me, that rebel part that I like to follow is to be that leader, to be out of the box, um, to be pushing the walls out constantly. And I do think of rock and roll as not necessarily music. I think about it as the the rebels of our time. And I, I think of Steve Jobs as a real rock star, for example, when I think of someone who really changed the world in terms of the way we communicate, think, um, all of those things. And so there's many, and, and a lot of the rock stars today musically are definitely changed from when I was growing up when it was male dominated. Today, it's the female. And it, I'm not saying rock is, it could be pop music, whatever, but it's a female dominated world today, which is really exciting. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's about pushing the walls out and, and not being afraid to try new things. You're speaking of that, not, not being afraid to try new things, you obviously, you know, launched this tequila company. You had done a lot in the music industry, a lot in the fashion industry. Um, what inspired you to go into to this new category? And, and what have you learned about yourself? And, and what have you learned about, again, um, this continual learning around building a brand and finding those collaborators to do it with you? Well, it, it happened it happened very organically with a young friend of mine, Nick Jonas. And Nick and I, uh, you know, met, I don't know now, seven years ago at a dinner and instantly became fast friends. And it, you know, we started spending time together and picking each other's brains about different things. We shared a lot of kind of, even though we grew up at different times, we shared a lot of uh, similarities in, in our family life. Um, I wasn't a pop star, so we didn't share that similarity. But um, we um, we we started to spend time together, and he spent time in my studio. And one day we talked about doing a fashion collaboration, which because he loves fashion, and we did do it, and it was extremely successful. And during that period of developing that product, we he would come into the studio, and he'd always be spraying my different fragrances on himself. And I said, you know, you love fragrance because. I don't know anybody who comes in here and does that as much. And he goes, yeah, I, want, I, I definitely am crazy about fragrances. And I said, we should do a fragrance. And we, we did three of them and were unbelievably successful. Two, one fragrance of the year amongst a huge category. And we just knew that we had something together. Unusual in that our ages are different. Our demographics are somewhat different. But we also know that our demos together are very potent because they're very broad. And... Um, Nick and I got to know each other over drinking tequila. And so a lot of fun moments that we had were over that. And I talked to him about why he loves tequila so much. And he said, well, I'm a, I'm a type one diabetic. Um, I, you know, I really can't drink anything with sugar and it's the healthiest of all the spirits. And I love the, just, I just love the taste of it. So we talked about it like, why do tequilas need to be like the best tequilas need to be $150 or more? Why can't you be ultra premium, but be 40 something dollars and $50 and that type of thing. And so we had this concept that we started to work together. We presented it to the Stoli group from Stoli Vodka group and they loved it. And we went down to Alisco, Mexico, where the, where tequila is born and so they're just, they had just bought a distillery down there, a uh, tequila distillery. And we met an amazing guy, which is the third part of our, of the three amigos kind of thing. His name's Arturo Fuentes. He's down there. They call him the godfather of tequila because he's created so many great brands. And we, we worked on, we just fell in love with the whole process. And we just started working on this product and we both are super passionate. We don't treat it as a as a um, side note in our world, it's it's something that we both wake up every day thinking about it, and we think about it in the evenings and with a glass of tequila. And um, and we we use all of our marketing skills, all of our 
the way we raised the bar on things, we wanted it to be best in class, like everything that we want to do. So we pushed for all of those things. And, you know, we launched during COVID, which was a crazy time. Like we launched like a couple months before COVID. So really, we were really into the middle of our launch right when COVID hit. And somehow through all of those things, we were able to navigate through it. But it really got back to trying to be best in class in everything that we do. And and, and, and also the storytelling that I talked about before by t- our story on how we met and how passionate we are about the product and the quality of the product um, and our meeting Arturo, our, our master distiller, and how important that was to making you know, something successful. And we tell that story to the consumer. We tell it to our distributors. We tell it to you know, everybody out there. And it's been, I think, a big part of it because people know it's very real. They know we just didn't stick our name on some tequila burning. You know, two last questions before um, you know we we wrap up. Um, I love that you shared the the story of Villa One and again how it comes back to what makes a great brand, um, the need for passion to fuel what you do, and and also finding um, great collaborators as well. Um, but you've also you know talked about sort of being the sponge and this continual reinvention. Um, how did launching this tequila company stretch you? Did you learn, um, and, and, and working with Nick especially, um, did you learn different things and, or new things about uh, building a brand or things that surprised you about yourself um, within this arena? Yeah, I mean, you know, Nick and I both were sponges off of each other, for sure. He's definitely another one that's like that. And, and he always talks about what he's learned from me, but I learned a lot from him as well, because he, uh, his tentacles in a culture that's younger than what I grew up in is really important. Plus, he's just a super smart guy. Um, but I also think that we were stretched to some degree, both of us, um, probably me a little bit more because he stopped touring and pr- stopped making movies for the most part during COVID. So he had a little bit more freedom. Um, but it, 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 again, raised my priorities on what was really important to me um, at that point in time. So I think that there were definitely challenges within it. You know, things slowed, of course, a bit during COVID. So that gave us a little bit more breathing room because running into it, I was running like crazy right when we were launching with everything. So we, and in some regards, there was a little bit of a silver lining there. I find the two silver linings with it was that, and also that I actually got to spend some real quality time with my family as well. But, um, that, that continues to this day, that whole learning process with that. We're learning a different industry. You're not totally in control of your destiny every day because you're because of the legalities around spirits. You can't distribute it yourself. It has to go through state approved distributors. They have a lot of other brands. You have to also get them to believe your story and to want to tell your story and and love your product because. And you can't make anybody love your product. That's why it's got to be so great. You know, when they taste it and they say, wow, I know we've got them hooked. Well, I love that because it speaks to how do you how do you stand out, right, in, in categories that are, are, are exactly. really competitive. Um, and some of these things that sound the most simple, right, in terms of making people love your brand or the storytelling, those are the hardest things to do, right? If it, if it sounds simple, um, sort of saying what's important, those are the hardest things to do and to execute on. Um, John, last question for you. The show is called The Takeaway. Um, you've shared some incredible advice um, around your life story um, and your creative and business endeavors. If people were to take a step back or if you're to take a step back at at your own life, um, what would you hope the takeaway is for others? What's the the moral of the John Robedo story that you think is really relevant for people, particularly at a moment like this? Now, first of all, follow your passions. You'll be you'll be most happy with that. I think a lot of people have them, but they're afraid to act on them or they feel that they need the security, which I understand of other things. But I think it's follow your passions for sure. Um, and I've kind of that's been my guidepost all along is to, and to stay true to them. Um, and the other one was the first thing I said um, in the conversation today is to if you're following your passion and whatever you do in life, just, you know, be a sponge out there, learn as much about what's exciting to you, what means something to you. It could be as simple as being a pa- great parent, but, um, but in a, in your career, it, it definitely is important. There's so many people that have other have forged um, great careers, great brands, 
And there's things to glean from them. They may not all be right for you. And only just one or two little tidbits could change everything. And I look for those little tidbits that make the meal in the end, you know? I love that. Well, well, John, thank you for sharing some of your, your tidbits with us. Um, you know, I always say you can't, you can't hit, hit fast forward on life experiences, but, but hopefully you can, you know, learn, learn from other people's. And so, um, you've given some great insight, great advice. Um, and, uh, can, congratulations on your continued success. I see that the bottles of Villa one over your shoulder, um, yeah. So, um, um, you know, cheers, cheers to, um, all that's ahead and thanks so much for, for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. It's been great talking with you. Thank you, John. And thanks to everyone. And we look forward to seeing you back here again next week.